And we're back now, and we're waiting for Adam Baldwin to call in. He should be calling in any moment now. Uh, but uh, we do have Kevin Glass from townhall.com, the managing editor there, who is working actually on a Gamergate article for uh, for Town Hall. A colleague of mine from Salem Communications. Kevin, say hi. Hey, guys. How's it going? Great. And also on the line with me right now is uh, the man known as Internet Aristocrat. And uh, great to have him on the line, one of the... Uh, one of the uh, activists in the gaming area. Uh, Aristocrat, uh, why don't you say hi to everybody? Uh, hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be on. And great, great to have you on. And I hope, um, I'm hoping that everybody can hear okay. We're going to go ahead and just, uh, uh, we're, we're going to hold off on, on getting started here. Uh, let's see. Just want to make sure that um, I'm just going to go ahead and. And people who are tuning in for the first time to the Ed Morrissey show are, are being schooled in the <laughs> schooled in the uh, in the uh, area of open source production values. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I produce my own show. Uh, this is from my home office, and uh, so you get a chance to see everything I'm doing. Joining me on the line now, the star of TNT's The Last Ship, Adam Baldwin. Also, just really a great guy and a friend of mine. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, Ed. Thanks for having us on. Appreciate it. And we already have Kevin and Aristocrat on the line. And, of course, we're talking about Gamergate. We have a huge chat room just waiting to hear you all talk about this. I am playing the role of interested moderator here. Uh, I think we've got a, a good lineup. and just want to preface this by saying we did extend a couple of invitations uh, for people who had um, opposing points of view to come on to the, um, to come on to the show. Uh, we did not hear back from them. Uh, but uh, so uh, we, we are proceeding nonetheless because this is an interesting topic. And in, in, in the beginning of the show, and, and Adam is a friend of Dwayne Patterson's as well, and, and Dwayne was doing his best to to uh, troll everybody in, in the gaming community. But this is, I mean, it's a, it, there are parallels to what happens to conservatives in the political arena here in, in terms of having political correctness imposed on you and also in terms of having a media that... Uh, may not necessarily operate under the uh, best of ethical provisions, Adam. And so this is a story that I think is a, a very intriguing media story and a very intriguing story about politics. Yeah, I, I'd like to focus on the, on the most important part is the journalistic aspects of companies that are basically in business to make ad revenue, providing information to gamers, and for them to go to war with gamers over their complaints seems, well, quote, unquote, suicidal or professionally suicidal, as some people have said out there. And I just don't understand. Maybe I do understand, but I'd like to hear it explained more clearly why folks on the other side, per se, I've tried to be as neutral as I can. Clearly, I've taken a position, but I've tried to put out both sides of the arguments as best I can. And uh, I, I just like, it's, it's shocking to see the vitriol and the silence that has uh, descended upon what, what could be a very productive conversation. Uh, aristocrat, um, your perspective on this as a, as a gamer, as somebody who's very active in the gaming community, uh, I'd like to get your take on this just to start us off here, a brief take on this. And, uh, I mean, do you feel like this is a, uh, this has been a, uh, a huge issue in the gaming journalism area? Well, yeah, for years now, um, people have always had concerns about, um, the ethical standards of different gaming media outlets. Uh, there were different events that have happened. Uh, one was called Dorito Gate, which was kind of an example of <clears throat> corporate sponsors kind of pushing or interceding into uh, game reviews and kind of intermingling the two. And it was it was seen as kind of like, oh, look, you know, they're in bad and you can't really trust them. But it was somewhat dismissed. Um, this, I think, what's happened over the past two weeks has been just a very clear and very blatant example of just how corrupt not only gaming journalism is, but game development is, at least on the indie level. Um, I think what shocked people the most about it is just, just how upfront it is, how much evidence is out there, uh, how much these people have left traces of it all over their social media accounts. There's no professional barrier between different reporting outlets. Um, they all know each other. They all talk to each other. 
and you know the connections are just they're they're myriad, um, and it's really it, it's really shocking when when you look at it. Uh, this all began with a blog post um, from a disgruntled ex-boyfriend from a man named Aaron. And if it had just been that alone, nobody would have cared. It would have just been a typical story. There are millions of them on the Internet. It's, it's not important. But it was the names connected to it that really caught interest. It was different journalists and different indie developers. And from that has grown just tons and tons of examples of journalists being financially tied to their stories or being in relationships with their stories. And throughout it all, the gaming media has refused to address any of this. And, and by the way, undisclosed. They were not disclosing these connections uh, in the way that you would expect to see full disclosure. And, and Kevin Glass from townhall.com, I mean, we've seen that type of thing come up in other areas of of grassroots journalism. We saw something similar a couple of years ago with the mommy bloggers in terms of um, freebies and 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 um, people being paid to write about certain things and that sort of thing without full disclosure of that. Uh, so there there was sort of a a learning curve, I think, in terms of ethics um, in in writing with that. In your opinion, is that what we're seeing here, or is this something a little bit um, a little bit different? So I think uh, there there are two good analogs for what's going on in the gaming journalism community. One in um, the broader, um, let's say, movie journalism community, and one that I think that we can all recognize an analog in the political community. I mean, we all read the mainstream newspapers. We read the Washington Post. And we don't assume that their reporters are unbiased, even though they're presenting themselves to be that way. And that kind of seems to be the analog that I'm seeing here. Um, what, what us as conservatives, what we would like is not necessarily – that the Washington Post cover politics in an unbiased way because we recognize that that's basically impossible. Everyone has certain viewpoints on, on politics. What we'd, we'd like is what you just dis uh, discussed is more disclosure, uh, that we, we would rather the Washington Post say, all right, this reporter is a Democrat. They've donated to these campaigns. This reporter uh, doesn't donate to anybody but votes Democrat. And I would, and you know, that kind of financial investment is the same kind of corrupting influence that we're seeing in the gaming journalism community right now. And 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 we might call it corrupting, but but to a certain extent, we might also say that it's inevitable, it's unavoidable that that journalists aren't these magical, uh, objective viewers of and consumers of news. They're invested in things. Um, and what we would, I think, uh, the gaming journalism community should learn from the conservative critique of political journalism, which is to disclose exactly what the, the journalists are involved with. So uh, whether that be uh, romantic relationships, which is kind of what kicked off, quote-unquote, Gamergate, or if it's uh, funding Kickstarter projects, or if it's uh, accepting ad revenue. I mean, we all see the ad revenue that a lot of these uh, – journalism websites and magazines receive. Um, but it's kind of, I think that, that what it needs is a, is a healthy dose of sunlight and disclosure, not necessarily for the journalists to pretend like they are objective arbiters of truth. Right. And, and, and again, I think when you're dealing with an industry, with, a, with journalism in an industry like gaming, where the people who are uh, writing about this are people who are interested in it. I mean, I mean, Adam, I mean, we see this, you know, for instance, movie critics. Movie critics are people who like to go to movies. They go to see movies. They like to go to events that have to do with movies and, or television shows, you know, either way. And so you, you, you can end up having a certain level of, uh, I want to say you can end up blurring lines maybe as a, as a good way of saying that. Uh, but Really, what, what you need there is you need two things. One is you should have at least a little journalistic distance and two, full disclosure, which is, I think, uh, and I'm, I'm hearing this, I think, from the panel, everybody would like to at least see as a minimum full disclosure. And this week, Adam, um, a couple of the sites that were involved in this uh, scandal have now finally put out disclosure um, rules on their on their websites. Well, that's, that's all well and good. The question uh, now becomes enforcement. You have... Right. What you, what what is perceived as a group think the for example there was a dropping of, I don't know, ten or so articles all on the same 
24 or 48 hour period that gamer is dead or that term gamer is dead or blah, blah, blah. They were basically hit pieces on gamers because they were misogynist or sexist, racist, whatever they are. So if those policies are not enforced internally, then they, they're, just, they're just pieces of paper. The other thing is that this, the, the reason the scandal blew up and, and what caught my attention was really the way the, the attack came. Uh, if you just broach a subject, you, you put something up online just to – you tweet something and people look at it. And the, the, basically, I, ca I call it the Twitter Inquisition descends upon you. And that's a, that's a, that's a tip-off that there's something there. Yeah. Uh, other things just get ignored. If there's no story there, they just get ignored. But if there's a story there, and I can understand why anyone would want to protect someone who's being attacked or harassed, coming to the defense of your friends, that's a noble thing. But it's really moved. It's moved beyond that, um, the thing that catalyzed this whole thing. And I, I see now this groupthink mentality. And, and gamers were pissed off that there was all this politics being injected in the first place. You want to go and read about games. You don't want to be preached to about you being a misogynist or you're watching games that don't have enough women in them or treat women uh, poorly. I mean, I was in Firefly. Firefly treated women both poorly and very well, very nobly. So there was a balance there, and I don't see that show getting attacked. There's a video online that... Um, Which you uh, sent me. Yeah, it's, it's a great video juxtapose the two uh very well so it's 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 natural backlash that's coming from people who just want to uh, learn about games i love games i love gamers and, and and by the way you sent me that video it is a great video i watched it um early today <laughs> early 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 today and again watched it this afternoon to um to make sure that i had it i had it pretty cold and uh and it is it's i mean it makes the point that you can slice and dice Almost anything, even shows that uh, that show women in a strong, positive light, which Firefly did. I mean, Gina Torres and, and Summer Glau and and Jewel um, Jewel Thwait, I mean, these were these were women who were vital to what was going on. These were they were they were movers and shakers in Firefly. But you can slice and dice that show to make them look like uh, victims and. Uh, uh, just objects and, and that sort of thing. So the video that you that you uh, sent over to me, Adam, is very good about showing how that can be, how, how the hypocrisy of this uh, can uh, can really uh, can really arise. Now, Kevin, I was talking to you earlier, and you said, and you were, you think that misogyny is actually an issue in the gaming community? Yeah, I do. Uh, I mean, go into any uh, you know lobby for a first person shooter, and and there will be people saying things that I wouldn't want uh, my mother hearing or my wife hearing or my daughter hearing. Or oh, and, like I, and I should stop you for just a moment. My mother is actually in this chat room. I just want to make sure everybody knows that. <laughs> my mother is actually in this chat room. So if you're going to call me names, um, just, you know, that was lame. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Kevin. I, did, I, I just, I thought that was funny. I, so go ahead. <laughs> I, I wouldn't recommend your mother go into a, a, a lobby for a first-person shooter. You know, a lot of people in the gaming community, and I think that Adam's right in one respect, and that's that, that uh, websites and journalists are maligning the term quote-unquote gamer um, way too broadly, and they're, they're indicting an entire community for the bad actions of a, a, a smaller group of people. But that group of people is still there, and unfortunately, you know, you go into online gaming, and they're often the loudest people there. Um, so I do think there is a kind of hesitancy when um, these indie game developers, you know, uh, the, the people who made Gone Home, the woman who made Depression Quest, uh, are making these games that are kind of counterintuitive and they have these socio-political messages that they're not really used to in the gaming community. Um, and there's a little bit of a backlash there. I don't think that it's, it's necessarily necessary to indict the whole community for that, but I do think that some people are trying to protect, quote-unquote, gaming in, in this pure uh, apolitical way that might not be healthy in the long run for, for the gaming industry. Um, Aristocrat, I want to bring you in on this. And by the way, I know that um, Aristocrat sometimes uses his first name. I, I, my, my, my writing partner for the last you know, six years 
is is very anonymous and wishes to remain that way. I respect anonymity, which is the reason why I'm just going to err on the safe side and use your handle because that's how people know you anyway, aristocrat. And uh, so I, I just wanted to answer that because people were saying, well, you can call them this in the chat room, but I'm I'm just going to stick with aristocrat. Um, and I mean, I want, I want to get your opinion on this because this was in this was actually one of the uh, it wasn't the catalyst of Gamergate, but this is kind of, this was kind of the, the, the subject that was boiling under, underneath the surface that Gamergate sort of allowed to break out into the open, which was the fact that uh, there has been a concerted effort over the last, um, I, I, I don't know, you're, you can tell me better than, um, than I can tell you, maybe last couple of years, two, three years to, uh, to look at, in, in gaming journalism especially, to look at gaming through the prism of uh, political correctness and and, uh, and 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 women's uh, I, I don't want to say women's rights because women have perfectly equal rights in, in, in gaming as anywhere else but in the way that the that the community treated women I I really want to hear your input on this because this is this is the thing I think that really got that really gets everybody uh, heated up on this right right well I, I mean really when you're looking at this and I, I think it's important to kind of remember this or to, to look at the scope of what we're talking about. Uh, when we talk about, you know, uh, journalists and their relationship to a source. Um, I, I just want to give a very brief overview of what kicked this off and what's come to light since this is, uh, be, you know, since it began. Um, so Aaron released his blog post about an indie developer named Zoe Quinn. That's the um, artist, that's the developer that made Depression Quest. Uh, now, it came to light that Zoe Quinn had had a relationship with Nathan Grayson somebody who works at Kotaku. Now, Stephen Stello, the editor-in-chief at Kotaku, has confirmed this. He went on to make a statement that, yes, Nathan did, in fact, have a sexual relationship with Zoe, but he states that it happened after the piece of public press, the positive press that he released. It, it began after that. Now, one of the interesting things is Grayson released an article on the 31st talking about a failed game jam that was, you know, uh, had advertisements from PepsiCo, and they talked about how Maddie Lessam was the reason that that game jam failed. On the same day that this piece of press goes up, Zoe Quinn opens her own game jam. She has a website designed for it. She has a donation button put on it. And the donations that go to that PayPal go directly into her account. So the moment this press goes up, the moment this story goes up, she is immediately able to make money off of it. Now, one of the sources in that story, Robert Narnot, is another person who alleged has had a relationship with it. Now, again, this was the catalyst. This is the thing that started it. Since that point, we found out that Kirk Hamilton uh, has donated money. He's another Kotaku reporter for, uh, for Kotaku. He's donated money to Zoe Quinn on Patreon. Now, Patreon is it's not like Kickstarter. You basically financially support somebody. It's a monthly stipend. Um, other people that have supported Zoe Quinn are Ben Kachera, Philip Collar from Polygon. Those are names that have been shown to be in uh, support of it. You can look at the Patreon page and see them both. Now, Polygon released a statement saying that they don't see anything wrong with that. Uh, they don't think that donating money monthly to a person in the industry you report on is an issue. Now, Stephen Stiller, editor-in-chief of Kotaku, said, no, we see that as an issue. Uh, one of the other things that has come up from this, I mean, even just recently, Jen Frank wrote a piece for The Guardian. Now, she defended Zoe Quinn. She didn't address any of the allegations about Gamergate or Zoe's manipulation of the media or how any of this went on. It turns out that not only does Jen Frank have financial ties to Zoe Quinn through Patreon, that Maya Kramer, a PR person working for Silver String Media, also has financial ties to Jen Frank. Now, Jen Frank said that when she ran the Guardian article, uh, that the people at Guardian, the editor, had said, it's not an issue, you don't need to disclose it. And there was backlash against that. Uh, other things that have come up uh, in relation to this, Maya Kramer seems to be a name that constantly pops up. You know, she works PR for Silver String. Silver String has this kind of relationship with different indie devs. You know, they, they, t they say that they're in trans media and that this is like a, a broad spectrum approach to advertising a product. Now, when you look at, when you look at all these people and all the relationships, you see these financial connections, these people financially supporting each other. There are relationships that have popped up. Uh, another Kotaku reporter, after, so Stephen Tatillo addresses Nathan Grayson and says, uh, I don't see it as an issue, the timetable doesn't match up. Then it comes out that reporters are financially supporting them. 
excuse me, Cecilio again says, okay, I do see that as an issue. We won't allow it anymore. Then after that happens, it turns out that Patricia Hernandez, another Kotaku reporter, had relationships with Anna Anthropy and Christina Love, two developers who she gave coverage to, multiple pieces of coverage to. She went directly to their games. She recommended you go buy them. Now, there wasn't a public statement about this. They instead went and edited the articles afterwards and tried to act like that was okay. These articles are years old. But, you know, we'll go in and we'll edit it. And it won't be a big deal. Uh, it, it's just, it's this incestuous relationship. It's this, this cronyism, this nepotism that's in the industry. And they won't report on it. They won't talk about it. Now, the reason this is important, the reason this is such a big story, is in relation to the fine young capitalists. Now, this is a group that wanted to do a, a charity, essentially. They said, hey, if you're a woman in game design, come to us, give us a pitch. We will build the game. We'll put the game out there. You'll get 8% of the revenue, and we will give the rest to charity. This is just about getting women in game design. It has nothing to do with politics. We just want to show that women are capable of making good games. Give us a chance. Now, Zoe Quinn and Maya Kramer are both, you can look in the social media accounts, harass these people, destroy their game jam. Now, when the Fine Young Capitalists talked about this publicly, they had stated that they had gone to different gaming journalism outlets and were told, we will not cover this. If Zoe Quinn says that you are corrupt or you're oppressive, you are. So it starts to illustrate the point that these people have relationships and financial ties to each other. And it's not just that they give each other public press and profit from it but it's they will deny press to others. They will influence uh, public opinion and make them look bad. So here are these people who wanted to do this charity event who can't get coverage from any of the major outlets, and why would they? Why would Polygon report on that? They're financially invested in this. Why would Kotaku report on it? They are financially invested in this. I mean, it, it, it's ridiculous when you look at this. And I could not imagine it in politics. <laughs> well, I hope not, but, well, I mean, but, 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 yeah, but... Yeah, 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 no. I, 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 unfortunately, I can't imagine it in politics, aristocrat. Uh, Adam, I want to get back, get you back in here. There was an article that came out today from Slate, so this is obviously starting to break out into the wider media. Uh, you know, Slate is a little bit more uh, of the of general journalism. It's definitely not a gaming journal, journalism site. You had David Auerbach, who is a, a pretty good a pretty good writer over at Slate, uh, give I think a pretty good thumbnail. A description of what's going on in the, uh, between the gaming community and gaming journalism, which is basically that gaming journalism has been lecturing people like Aristocrat and the folks that are in the chat room today about about being misogynist, about being uh, about being irredentist. I don't know, free thinkers, whatever you want to call them, you know, Masons. Who knows? Um, and 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 frankly. They're tired of it, so they're going elsewhere. They're they're talking amongst themselves. They're 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 starting up their own grassroots efforts uh, to cover these things, and they're basically ignoring uh, gaming journalism. And therefore, gaming journalism is on its way to being dead. Uh, I I found this to be a really helpful article to get to to leverage into this. But this is um, almost I, I, you could write this almost exactly the same way about how talk radio emerged for conservatives or how the blogging community emerged for conservatives in reaction to how national media treated conservatives. I mean, it's not that much different, is it? No, the similarities are striking and you can see the ratings uh, in the television world uh, when you have competition, uh, either of Fox News and, you know, there are going to be people on the left who, who don't like Fox News, who demonize Fox News, but the proof is in the pudding. People are it has eyeballs for a reason, and the other ones are, have have lost eyeballs for a reason. And this is the same thing unfolding in uh, this gaming journalism. And I think a lot of it has to do with just people being arrogant with and smug with their own opinions, and they think that they can force it down. You know, the coincidence. This was that those those ten articles? I, I keep thinking back to this. Those ten articles dropped within a forty-eight hour period, right before that big PAX convention. So it seemed like it was a PR campaign to go into that PAX convention that they were going to talk about it there. But this GamerGate sort of uh, short-circuited that, and that's why it was stunning. So there was something afoot. It, it just the Occam's razor says that. 
you know, the simplest explanation is, is the one you go with. And, uh, it just, it just smells bad. There's smoke there. Yeah. Now, Kevin, I mean, you've, you've, you, you're going to be writing about this at town hall. Is that correct? Yeah. And, and I, I, you know, I, I get what you're saying. I think that, you know, you can, you can look at anything and you can say, well, there's elements of this in an audience or there's elements of that in an audience. And you and I have been professionals running websites for a long time. And, and you know, and I know that uh, it's one of the least legitimate ways that you can criticize someone by, by pointing at their comment section and saying, well, you've got some guy, I mean, we just had one that we had to bounce out the other day, unfortunately, who, who just was, um, well, we, we run into these folks every once in a while. They're, they're trolls. And you, when you find them, you, when they emerge, you kick them out. Uh, but you can't judge hot air by the b behavior of a few commenters. You can't really judge the gaming industry either or, or gamers by the actions of a few immature people who just can't handle themselves on online. Uh, I, that's my take on, on this idea that there's this deep misogynistic thread that runs through gaming and gamers. And I say that now full disclosure as somebody who is not immersed in that culture either, but just, I, I'm always leery about these types of blanket attacks and, and blanket analyses of how games work. And there's this, you know, game gamers and gaming is, 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 is part of the patriarchy sort of approach. I just find that to be very, very, um, facile, <laughs> I guess is the best way of putting right. it. Uh, I would, I would say that's the, that you're right, that you can't like, you can't indict hot air for their, for the bad commenters. You can't indict town hall for the bad commenters. Um, I would say what's, what's probably more likely is, is that gaming kind of originated and has continued to exist as a largely male dominated uh, industry, uh, at least on the consumer side, right? So, and you look at even, you know, top level, quote unquote, professional gamers, uh, we think of games like Pokemon as games that trend more towards the feminine side of the spectrum, but like the professional gamers are still all male. Uh, and, and, and so the game developers really make games for men because, or men or boys, I'm not exactly sure what the demographics are, um, just because that's what their audience is. And in response to that, you know, gaming has been getting more mixed in recent years, and, we, and you see uh, women and feminists and other uh, people on the social justice end of the spectrum critiquing kind of the way that gaming has evolved as an industry. And I'm not, and I'm not going to say that it's because of misogyny or because of pa patriarchy or anything like that. Um, it's just kind of a historical accident that games were adopted by males and were, have been made for males. And now it's kind of just moving to the point where they're saying, oh, well, why don't we make more games for women? Um, and a lot of these indie gamers feel like they've been shut out of the mainstream of, of gaming because you know, that is male dominated and they feel like uh, it's harder for them to gain a foothold there than in making some of these indie games that, that kind of spurred this. Um, I do, actually, I want to ask a question of Adam. Uh, is that okay, Ed? Sure, um, yeah. Because uh, uh, we talked about the kind of surge of coverage for a game going into the PAX convention, right? And it almost looked like a coordinated assault. And I wanted to ask him, uh, in his professional experience, you know, does that happen in the non-gaming industry? Does it happen for movies heading into Comic-Con or something like that, um, where, where it looks like a certain movie is getting a lot of great coverage and maybe less like coverage, even that it might well, be an accident? Well, there's, there's a difference between a coordinated PR push for a movie or a TV series than for a political... Uh, a political campaign that's couched as uh, reporting. See, that's the problem. It's, it's pretending to be journalism, but it's really uh, a political agenda that's being forced uh, on the community. And it, it's, it's almost as if there, there just weren't experienced enough journalists doing it. They were like hack bloggers, and they, they didn't think they would get caught. Yeah, I mean, I think that that that's sort of uh, that's been sort of my impression of this is that what you've got is you've got 
people who were inexperienced at, at doing this didn't understand how, you know, when, when, when there was a lot of attention being paid to it, how it would look. Now, I want to turn to aristocrat because there's a point that Kevin brought up and, and, and I want to make this really clear. I look, I mean, it, gaming is an art form. It's a, it's a, it's a social structure, just like any other, just like movies, just like television, just like music. And I, it's fine if feminists want to pull this apart and, 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 and have their say on it. I mean, that's part of what a free debate is about. I think the issue here, though, and I, I'm, I'm going to ask this specifically to aristocrat who's immersed in this, is that the journalists all seem to just take up that cause and started, in, in the words of somebody who just tweeted this to me, have been sort of coalescing into an attack group on the gamers that are their really should be their their, their customers their readers the, the people that uh they want to trust them and and i think that's the that's the difference is it not that's what that's what the the gamergate problem is is that you have all of these if you want to call it social justice if you want to call it you know feminism whatever you want to call it you have all this coalescing and it's like the journalism world just decided that they were going to adopt this and lecture people about it rather than do journalism is that is that more or less what you were, more or less the main complaint here? <clears throat> well, no, I wouldn't say it's the main complaint, but I would say it's one of the major complaints. Yeah, it's the attitude of these journalists to, rather than address uh, the issues that are taking place, rather than coming out and talking about the corruption, talking about the different connections, and saying we have to take a stance on this uh, ethically, or, you know, ethically um, instead to turn it around on gamers and say, the only reason you're interested in this is because you hate women. Uh, the only reason you're interested in this is because you're a nerd, uh, you're white, you're male, um, you're privileged. And this is kind of the message that has been bombarded against us. You know, when Adam was talking about these different articles that dropped, yeah, there were about 10 to 12 of them in the span of about 24 hours, some that were minutes apart, minutes apart. So it, it makes you wonder when you're looking at that as an outsider, are these articles being released because there is a concerted effort by a PR firm or, you know, is there some kind of collusion going on? Or are these journalists so devoid of any ethics that they're just plagiarizing? Are, are they just lifting each other's words? Because the articles are so similar. If gamers are dead, gamers uh, is not, you know, it's not something for the future. We need to make uh, gaming media that's going to be, you know, artistic and socially relevant rather than a consumer product. They're, they're trying to make it into their own political playground. And that is one of the major complaints. But it backfired on them. I mean, uh, you know, kind of growing up aside the Gamergate uh, issue over the past two weeks has been not your shield. And that a ton of people just frankly coming out and saying, listen, I'm black, I'm gay, I'm transsexual, I'm a feminist. Stop talking for me. You people are insane. I'm a gamer too. This has nothing to do with what's going on. This is about corruption. People have just had enough. They're sick of being lectured to, and they want them to address their own failures. And they're so blatant, they're so open about it. That's what's so infuriating about it. Greg Tito, the editor-in-chief at The Escapist, released a statement saying, yeah, we ran a previous story on Zoe Quinn. We didn't fact-check any of it. We took her word for it, and we ran the story. Because we have an agenda. This is what he personally said. We have an agenda, and we're going to help people we feel are being harassed. You're a journalist. You're supposed to look. You're supposed to investigate to make sure that you're not putting out false information. Right. Now, he later went on to say, that's my own personal opinion, you know, as if his boss stepped into the room and said, what the hell are you doing? But <laughs> it, it, it's ridiculous when you're looking at these people. It, it's just, yeah, it, it has been, first they were silent about it, then they tried to censor it, and there's evidence of that everywhere. Uh, there, there's evidence of Quinn talking to major moderators on boards on Reddit, you know, where there was one thread that had 25,000 comments in it, tens of thousands of them deleted. Websites have been taken offline. Games, Nosh, and Tech Raptor were taken offline because they dared to talk about this. Videos have been pulled off of YouTube because they dared to talk about this. So when censorship failed, when it spread past that, they tried attacking. And it was, you know, gamers are horrible, gamers are dead. And people basically said, we're not buying it. Gamers are everybody. It's not just the white guy. It's everybody. And we're sick of being your puppets. We see that you're trying to make money off of this. It's clickbaiting. It's yellow journalism. You don't have ethics, and you won't address your own failures. Stop. And so now they're running around like a chicken with their head cut off. They don't know what to do. My suggestion, I mean, you know, we're talking about, oh, they're just bloggers. Stephen Patillo has a master's in journalism. A lot of these people have degrees in journalism. They should know better. They have no excuse for this behavior. And I, I'm, getting, I'm getting comments from Twitter. I'm getting comments in the chat room. 
a couple of things from Twitter. Um, you have um, uh, you have somebody who's just uh, Pastafarian on Twitter is 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 uh, corroborating what you said. Twenty five thousand uh, deleted off of Reddit. Um, you have um, Ivy. Uh, Ivy Twisted on Twitter saying it's important to mention that gamers are a diverse community that consists of all uh, ages, races, and genders. And and I think that that's that's part of the issue is that the, the 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 coverage of this would make you think that they're all you know twenty something white uh, young men who are living in their parents' basements. I mean that <laughs> what Dwayne joked about yeah, at the yeah, beginning of the show, yeah. right? You know, and and so. Yeah, I mean that's, that's that's the narrative they're putting out. That's the narrative. All right, I, I I've only got you guys. I'm already running over, so I want to thank you guys for your patience. First off, but uh, and fortunately, we don't have a particular time slot here. It's not like regular radio. I can I can I can go longer, but um, I don't want to abuse your uh, abuse your uh, hospitality or, or your or your time here. I'd like I'd like to have each of you kind of wrap up. Uh, what you think about Gamergate and where it needs to go. And we're going to start with Kevin from Town Hall. Sure. Uh, so something that uh, we were just talking about, I think uh, the gaming press is relatively a, a new industry, right? Um, and the gaming industry is relatively a new industry. I think we're going to see it evolve uh, closer to where the movie press and the movie industry is. So, uh, so gamers or, or, or the people who are upset uh, about the journalists that push these indie games, uh, regardless of, of their personal relationships with these developers, they're upset because uh, they, they critique the games that, that are getting these, uh, this positive press as fat games. And largely, you know, you look at the sales numbers, that's true. Um, I would analogize it to the, the movie press. Uh, you look at the year 2005. The movie that got the most press coverage, the most favorable press coverage, was probably Brokeback Mountain, which uh, was a in- relatively small movie that uh, not a whole lot of people saw. It wasn't in the top 20 grossing movies of the year, uh, but it had a sociopolitical message that the uh, movie journalism community wanted to push. Uh, what didn't get press that year were movies like Star Wars Episode Three and King Kong and War of the Worlds, which are these blockbuster games that I would analogize to kind of the blockbusters in gaming. Uh, you know, like Destiny, which is coming out soon, a first-person shooter, the Call of Duty franchise, things like that, the things that make money year after year. And the gaming press isn't interested in that, and the gaming community wants them to be interested in that. But I think that we're going to see a divergence here where it gets to a point where the gaming press is more similar to the movie press and that they're covering these indie games with sociopolitical messages that aren't going to gross a whole lot of movies. And there might be a, a, a whole lot of money. And there might be a, a, a reaction to that and a new gaming press emerge to cover these uh, massive first-person shooter popular games, but that the gaming press themselves will kind of evolve into uh, a status where they're covering things that uh, have these messages that they're interested in, and some of their audience might get left behind here. A lot of their audience might get left behind here. I mean, that leaves a huge opening, does it not? For gra- I, I'm just going to follow up once with Kevin here. Does that not leave a huge opening for grassroots journalism? For other, I mean, you're talking about like a Breitbart-sized hole that you can move something into, or or even even a a slate-sized hole that you could move into. I think in that in that sense, aren't don't you think? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah Kevin. Yeah. I think that. Yeah, well, I don't want to monopolize the time here, but yeah, I, de- I definitely think there we'll see a rise, a backlash against this in, in the gaming journalism press. Yeah, I mean that's 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 what happens when you when you leave your audience behind, which is what David Auerbach is talking about at Slate. Um, all right, uh, Aristocrat, I'm going to ha- give let you give a, a wrap up here and, and tell us where you think this needs to go. I think there needs to be reforms. I think sites need to be more open. I don't think that they should be allowed to financially contribute on a monthly basis through services like Patreon to people in an industry they cover. I think they need to address the entire debacle surrounding Joey Flynn, Mike Kramer, and Silverstream Media to talk about uh, these different PR companies that seem to be so close to these different journalism sites and to these different developers. You know, they try to play it off like it's not a big deal. You know, the classic dodges, we're bloggers when we get criticism, but we're journalists when we want uh, special, you know, items or uh, access. 
but what they failed to take into consideration is, you know, was it just last year with the Media Shield bill? I mean, you had, you know, a senator, senators basically saying, we want to only allow protection to real reporters, you know, not, not 17-year-olds with their own websites. So when they are this corrupt and when they're this blatant about it, it hurts the fifth estate. It hurts actual online journalists because people in pol- you know, political positions in Washington will look at this and will say, see, they're not real journalists. They don't adhere to any ethics. They don't deserve protection for sources. It, you know, it, it creates a major issue. They're not, they're not seeing the bigger picture and the damage that they're doing to other journalists online in different industries. It is a dangerous president to set. People are sick of the narrative that's been spun at them. They don't buy it anymore. And you're calling us misogynists and sexists and pigs isn't going to work. Demonizing us as nerds doesn't make any sense. We're your customers. I don't know what your advertisers are thinking doing business with you, but it will not be profitable in the future for you to continue this. All right, Adam, I'm going to have you have the last word here. Um, wh- where do you see this going, and and what specifically needs to happen right now? I see the adults stepping into the room now. I see some editors and some uh, major journalists. Um, this guy, uh, I haven't had a chance to read the article. Uh, Eric Kane over at Forbes just uh, put one up. So it's broken into the mainstream. It's a real story. They didn't cover it up. That's good. That's a good thing. Sunlight is a good thing for these organizations because, you know, frankly, a lot of them, they love games. They just got blindsided into this political agenda. And so hopefully this will just sweep that political agenda away. And these special snowflakes who have been called out on the map and found out that there's competition out there in the real world and they can't just live in their ivory tower and preach down to the the lower slopes of Olympus, as it were, they're going to have to mature a bit. All right. So um, I want to just go around the go around the room, just to make sure we're promoting everybody. Internet Aristocrat, he's on Twitter at INT underscore Aristocrat. And you have your own YouTube channel, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I just put up uh, random videos. Nothing, nothing too big. I just kind of got, you know, sucked into this like I think everybody else did. Well, there you uh, go. It's just that's a huge story. That's yeah. that's that's uh, getting sucked into things. That's how I became a blogger too, Aristocrat. <laughs> so sounds very familiar to me in, a, in an odd way. Kevin Glass at Townhall.com. Of course, my uh, Salem, uh, my Salem brother over there at Townhall.com. You're going to have an article coming up on this. When do you think that's going to hit? Uh, probably this weekend. Excellent. So keep an eye out for that. We'll have an article up on that at Townhall.com. And Adam Baldwin, of course, is uh, the star of TNT's The Last Ship. Um, uh, where are you, Nathan James? Was the last communique we got from that, Adam? When, when's the next episode come up? I mean, this is like a, a few months from now, is it not? It's a summer show, brother. We <laughs> start we start film we start filming again soon, very soon. So, thank you for watching. Thanks for giving us this forum. I really appreciate it. Well, it was very uh, fair. I wish I wish the guys we had and the ladies that we had extended invitations to from the quote unquote opposition had chosen to come on and had a conversation they would see that we're not we're not mean old misogynists we're just seeking the truth so thanks for providing me uh the forum well and, and i have to thank adam because he did a lot he did a lot of work in, in pulling this together too so thank you very much for all your assistance in doing that adam take care take care all right thank you very much all three gentlemen kevin glass internet aristocrat and adam baldwin thanks for being on today thank you very much thank you and that is it those guys have done a great job and i hope that you have enjoyed that i'll I'll tell you that's uh that's not uh that that's outside of my comfort zone folks but uh, i gotta tell you it was a heck of a lot of fun and very informative uh, on a a topic that i really am am, am, uh, new to i want to thank everybody in the chat room Uh, you know I'll be honest with you. We don't get maybe we get maybe a tenth of this traffic, if that, on on the normal Ed Morrissey shows, and uh, and of course when you have this flood of of new people that come in, you always kind of wonder, well, how's it going to go? First off, you're crossing your fingers that the technology is going to stay <laughs> it's going to stay up long enough for the show. Before the show, about a half an hour before the show, storm clouds started rolling in here, and I'm thinking, oh, this is good. I'm going to get a, we're going to get a storm that blows through here, knocks out the power, and I'm not going to be able to do the show. You guys were great. 